Now let's just have a word of prayer together. Father, we thank you for your written word. We thank you for your living word, Jesus. We thank you for your written word, the Bible. And we ask and pray, Lord God, that you would come and shine the light of your spirit upon it to us, Lord God. Would you speak to us, Lord God? Would you help? Would you encourage us? Would you challenge us? Would you correct us? Would you stir us, Lord God, to follow you better in all that we are and do? And Lord, may we take your word seriously, Lord God. May we meditate upon it day and night. And Lord, on this particular passage of scripture, we ask and pray, would you come now and be our teacher? And open our eyes by the power of your spirit to all you want to show us, we ask. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we've just finished, uh, if you've been here for the last few weeks, we've just finished a series on the book of Ephesians, six chapters, and we had chapter six last, last week. Uh, so we've finished the book of Ephesians, as it were. But I thought just before we move on, I'm just going to do one more thing uh, about the church in Ephesus. And we get an amazing snapshot, three different timeline snapshots into the church in Ephesus. So we've read the letter that Paul wrote from prison. But what I'm going to do, I'm just, just by looking at three different scriptures, most of it is the passage we looked at, or just had read. We're going to get three snapshots of points that I'm going to pick out of what four keys to a transformed church or four keys to a healthy church. And I'll tell you how we do that because in Ephesians, sorry, in Acts chapter 19, we see the church in Ephesus being planted by Paul. So that's what we just heard or read. That is the Ephesian church coming into being. It didn't exist before, but Paul in Acts 19, we see him planting church in Ephesus, the Ephesian church. And that difficult to know exact timelines on the Bible because you know, scholars like to argue about when exactly. But let's just say approximately uh, Acts 19, was re- the, 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 the passage that's been referred to here, was about AD 52. That's when the church in Ephesus that we've been thinking about the last six weeks was planted. And then about 10 years later, in about AD 62, Paul writes the letter to the Ephesians that we read for the last, we've looked at for the last six weeks. So that was probably about 10 years later, Paul in prison writes a letter to the Ephesians to the church that he'd planted 10 years earlier in 50, AD 52, book of Ephesians, AD 62. And then we're going to take one final, the last point, move on about 35 years to about AD 95 or AD 96, and that is Jesus writing his letter in the book of Revelation to the church in Ephesus. And by having a look at these three timelines, AD 52, 10 years later, and then finally, you know, probably 45 years after the church was planted, I just picked out four keys to a transformed church, four keys to a healthy church, and four keys that should be true for any and every Christian church, past, present, and future. So that's where we're going. I hope that makes sense. And the first point I'd like to make is this. Be a Jesus-centered church. Be a Jesus-centered church. Acts 19 verses 4 and 5 say, John told the people to believe in the one coming after him. That is in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. Okay, so this is Paul in Acts 19. He's on one of his, I think, his second missionary journey. He's in Ephesus, and he's looking around, and he finds these 12 guys, 12 fellas, 12 chaps, and they haven't quite got it. Well, they're, they're trying to follow God as best they can, but there's a couple of major things that they don't understand until Paul comes and explains it to them and then plants a church on the back of these just 12 guys in Ephesus. In fact, in verse 7, it says um, there were about 12 men in all. But the interesting thing is, here are 12 guys in Ephesus. They've been, you know, they've had John's baptism for the baptism of repentance, and they're serious about God. They're wanting to go for God. And then Paul asks them a question. What baptism did you receive? And they said, well, John's baptism, the baptism of repentance. 
there are 12 people here and they've never heard really about the importance of properly, correctly following Jesus. So Paul immediately baptized them into what? Into the name of Jesus. Christian baptism is always in the name of Jesus, Father, Jesus, Holy Spirit. Not just repentance, and repentance is very important, but it's in the name of Jesus. Christians are followers of the way, uh, or Christians. Uh, we follow Jesus. And these guys, they're, they're trying their best, but they just don't have any theology books to read. They haven't got, can't go and check things out. And here's a group of people trying to be church, but they don't have Jesus at the center of anything that they're doing until they meet with Paul and everything begins to change. I don't know about you, but I can give my own testimony on this one. I was a regular churchgoer for the first 18 years of my life. Used to go regularly. I knew exactly when to stand up, when to sit down. I knew the liturgy by heart. I knew exactly what service was going to happen because it was the same every week. Never changed, always the same. So I knew all of those sort of things. And I can remember someone asking me at the age of 18, why did Jesus die on the cross? And I couldn't give them a proper answer. I'd been in church for years, but I hadn't yet that one piece of wasn't a follower of Jesus. And I became a Christian when I was 21 years old. I'm sure I've told you many times. But for me, it was the Jesus piece that had been missing, even from my time going to churches, um, uh, you know, in an earlier age. So yes, it is possible to do church and not have Jesus at the center. If I could have gone to church for how many years and heard how many sermons, but actually, uh, it wasn't really a church that preached a great deal about Jesus. And so I was effectively lost and, until I gave my life to God. So it is possible. And let me tell you that any church that doesn't have Jesus right at the center of everything that it does and is, be very careful because it's unlikely to be a truly Christian church. Every church, whatever denomination, whatever, if it's a Christian church, it has to have Jesus Christ front and center. A, a church is not about the, the pastor. It's not about the denomination. It's not about the liturgy. There's only one key hallmark of any true church is that Jesus Christ is center stage in everything. And that is what wasn't the case in Ephesus at the beginning. Uh, we didn't quite work that Jesus bit out at all yet until they're baptized into the name of Jesus and things begin to change. And a Christian, any form of Christianity isn't completely guided by Jesus, uh, led by Jesus, revolving around Jesus, is going to be a misguided and warped sense of Christianity. And even denominations, whatever the denomination needs to be very careful that the denomination does not become God. Jesus is the only one who's God. Whatever denomination we might be from, the, denomina is not, the denomination is not the key factor. The key factor is one person alone, and that is Jesus Christ. And a Christian is a follower of Jesus Christ. And important that we, we realize that one. And that's what the, the Ephesian church uh, had to realize pretty quickly, and they do. So what does a Jesus-centered church, what does a Jesus-centered life look like? Well, let's think of all different areas of our lives. Our work, our business, our leisure, our family, our relationships, our finances, every area. Jesus should be taking number one place, every area of our lives. We don't just follow Jesus when we come to church for an hour and a half on a Sunday morning. We follow Jesus all the time. So there's not a single area of our lives which is off limits to where we shouldn't be Jesus-centered in. And I'll be honest, when I became a Christian, it took me a while to work on some of these. <clears throat> it probably took the longest while for Jesus to work on Jesus being the center of my finances. Um, Jesus, you can have my spiritual life, but I think I'll hold on to the financial bit. And I realized, actually, Jesus needs to have every area of my life, not just some areas. And, and so what does a Jesus-centered life look like? It looks like a, a life that has Jesus, can come into any room in our life, and we're comfortable with that. We're not trying to keep Jesus out of a few rooms that are just ours. No, it's all his. And same for a church. What should a Jesus-centered church look like? Jesus-centered church should be a church that has Jesus up front and central um, in everything. This is a true story that happened in the former Soviet Union. Um, 
when it was difficult to be a church. There was an underground church that was meeting. It wasn't a huge church, but they were meeting underground and they were worshiping quietly. And suddenly the door was kicked in and two soldiers with uh, rifles came in. And they, they shouted in Russian, everyone, put your hands in the air and up against the wall. So they all did that. And then he, the soldier said, he said, if anyone's willing to renounce Jesus, you can leave now. Nothing will happen to you. And most, almost all the church stayed, but two or three of them did, did just take the opportunity to leave. He said, one last chance. You can leave now. Nothing will happen to you. One more person left, but almost all of the church just stayed, hands up in the air, up against the wall. After the last person had left, they closed the doors, and the guards said to them, said, now you can, you can remain with your hands standing in the air, but this time in worshiping Jesus. And they thought, well, what's that about? And what it was, this, this, uh, they were part of a little group that was speci- had been specially formed to, to try and close down some churches. But in one particular church, a number of months earlier, they'd actually been sitting at the back before they revealed who they were, and actually they, 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 they'd both been converted. And what they said to the church was this. They said, we're, we're sorry to have frightened you, but we have learned that unless people are totally Jesus-centered and willing to die for Jesus, they cannot be fully trusted. Now, I don't know how you and I would respond if two soldiers with rifles came in and said exactly the same to us. What are we going to do? And hopefully none of us have to die for Jesus, but we are all to live for Jesus. And what would you and I have done if we'd have been in that that situation? Um, Jesus being center of everything. So that's the first point. Second point. Oh, no, actually, just stay on that first point. Just one one last thing. Verse 17. It says, uh, we didn't read that verse, but in Acts 19 and verse 17, it says, the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honor. So what's happened here is that there's a real community transformation. Things are changing as people are hearing about Jesus. And it says the name of Jesus was held in high honor. That should be written over every church, wherever they are. The name of Jesus is held in high honor. Okay, second point is this. Be a spirit-filled church, verses 2 and 6. Verse 2 says, Paul asks these 12 you know, young, these guys are trying to, trying to do church. He says, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, no, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. <laughs> so this church, God bless them, these 12 guys, they're not really quite clued up about Jesus until Paul points them to Jesus and haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Um, and so what happens in verse 6, it says, when Paul placed his hands on them, these 12 guys, the Holy Spirit came on them and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. So here was an attempt at a church that wasn't Jesus-centered, wasn't open to the Holy Spirit either. It's a fledgling church and it's struggling in these two areas. And as I've said, I'm sure before, you know, trying to, to live as a Christian um, without being filled with the Holy Spirit is impossibility. We'll never be very effective. We'll never get very far. It's like trying to drive a car without any petrol in it. We're never, ever going to get very far. We can be sitting in a car. We can be holding the steering wheel of the car. We can even try and push the car a little bit, but we're not going to get very far. It has to have the petrol in it for it to be a proper car. And for us as, as Christians and for these 12 guys in Ephesus, they needed the reality of God's Holy Spirit filling them in order that they might live in the way that God had designed them to live. And not just them, every Christian is designed to be filled with the third person of the Holy Trinity, the Holy Spirit. And when we're filled with the Holy Spirit, everything begins to change. For us as individuals and for a church, A church that is going nowhere, when it's filled with the Holy Spirit, starts going somewhere and with someone. And in verse 11, it goes on to say, Paul did extraordinary miracles through Paul. And in fact, the Holy Spirit is doing such amazing things in the community at Ephesus 
that there's real community transformation. Paul's there for two or three years preaching the gospel, and the whole Ephesian community is starting to be changed. At one point, we read that all those who were pra pra practicing black arts and sorcery and demon worship and all sorts of other things, they came and brought their expensive scrolls and parchments, and there was a big bonfire. Why? Because Jesus and the Holy Spirit were starting to impact people's lives and making such a difference that people were, were convicted of, of sin and wanting to, to get right with God. And there was a holy bonfire when uh, lots of things that were not of God were, were, were put to flame. And so the encouragement for us as a church and the encouragement for us as individual Christians is to make sure that our Holy Spirit tank remains full, not just with a you know, one bar, two bars left on the, you know, actually full is, is, is how it should be. So that's the second point we see. Two keys to a transformed church so far. Be a Jesus-centered church. Be a Holy Spirit-filled church. Third one, still in Acts 19 passage. Be a witnessing church, verses 8 and 10. Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. Wow, they're becoming a witnessing church. So they didn't have Jesus, they didn't have the Holy Spirit, they weren't really very good at evangelism, but now the church is starting to come on fire and come alive. And all sorts of things are starting to happen. And, it and it, interesting, it says, it says, Paul spoke the word of God boldly. And that word boldly means with conviction, and it means without fear. There was no fear in Paul's preaching. He was bold, he was confident, not in himself, but in God. And what about you and I? When it comes to telling other people about Jesus, are we bold or are we fearful? There's never any reason for us to need to be fearful when we're sharing the good news of Jesus. And what I love about what, what Paul does with the church in Ephesus, he actually stays in Ephesus longer than most places. Often he would just be a short time, point some elders, and then move on. Here he stayed for quite some time. And, and it actually says in verse 9, it says, Paul took the disciples with him and had discussions daily at the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This went on for two years so that all the Jews and Greeks in the province of Asia Minor heard the word of the Lord. So Paul's speaking the word of God boldly, but he says, not just me, guys, not just for me to do that, it's for the whole church to be a witnessing church. And as typical of Paul, he spends the first, as long as he's, before they kick him out, the first three months, he's in the synagogue, he's preaching the gospel, and then they've, we've had enough of Paul, off you go. Um, and where, so where does he go? He looks around, and he's, he, here's this big lecture hall. The Hall of Tyrannus. It was, uh, you know, a person uh, who, who used to give lectures in this hall, and uh, probably in the hot part of the day, actually, it wasn't being used, and said, Paul, I'm going to hire that place. It's almost like hiring a bit of a university campus to preach the gospel. And it says, daily, not just once a week, daily. There's Paul, and who's he got with him? It says, Paul took the disciples with him and had discussions daily in the Hall of Tyrannus. So they're all starting to learn how to be a witnessing church, how to tell other people about Jesus, how to point others to Jesus. And it's having an amazing effect. Everyone in Asia Minor is hearing the gospel. Wow. Just imagine if we were to do that here in Bangkok, you know, hire one or two halls and just do some appropriate outreach and evangelism. Suddenly, we will be a witnessing church and people will respond, I can tell you. When the gospel is preached, people will respond. And I know there are many people just waiting to hear uh, the good news of Jesus in uh, Bangkok. So he gets the whole church involved in this evangelism. Um, praise God. And the church, church grows. Why? Because they're now Jesus-centered, they're spirit-filled, and because they're being a witnessing church. They're not just keeping their Christianity very quiet, very private, very silent. I won't tell anyone about it. I just do my own little thing. Actually, if Jesus has transformed our lives, he wants to use us to transform the lives of others too. So, three points. We've got them so far. Fourth point. Be a love-filled church. 
And there's two scriptures I'm going to use for this. I've just written one up here at the moment. And here we're into, we're out of Acts now, AD 52. We're into the letter to the Ephesians. About 10 years later, Paul reminds them, hey, church, I pray that you being rooted and established in love. He knows that one of the key hallmarks of the church that he planted, Jesus-centered, spirit-filled, witnessing, and full of the love of Jesus and love for one another. They're a church, the Ephesian church, in their planting and establishment, they're a church that takes the two golden commandments seriously. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. They're a church that's been rooted and established in love right from their foundation, from their planting, right at the very beginning. And, and they were a church that were planted in the love of God. However, about 35 years on from where Paul writes the letter here in about AD 62, let's call it AD 96, so something around maybe 40, 45 years perhaps after Paul had first planted the Ephesian church. Jesus writes a letter to the, the Christians in Ephesus. And in the book of Revelation, Jesus writes seven letters to seven churches. Actually, they weren't just the individual churches. They were general for everyone. But here's what Jesus says to the church in Ephesus that has been rooted and established in love, uh, you know, 40, 45 years earlier. And in Revelation Chapter 2 and verse 4, the letter to Revelation, Jesus said, you know, well done, you're working hard, you're persevering, you know, good things. And they must have thought, great, Jesus is giving us a little pat on the back. And then comes the absolute bombshell for the Ephesian church, Revelation 2 verse 4, Jesus says to this church that Paul's planted, but I have this against you. You have forsaken your first love. And the whole church must have, it must have been like a body blow. Yeah, we were a church at the beginning. We were rooted and established in love, but we've lost our love for Jesus. We've lost some of the passion that we once had for God. We're not quite that church that we, you know, we, you know, thought we were. And it would have been an absolute bombshell for them to have to read this letter from Jesus. So you can see how even just in 45 years, this church has started to lose one of the keys for it to be a healthy and a transformed church. And I don't know if they're arguing or gossiping or bitter or twisted or exactly what's happening, but they've lost their first love for Jesus, and Jesus is bothered about it. It matters. And you know, the application for us as Christians in a church is, what about our love for God first and foremost? What about our love for one another? Are we a church that specializes in wagging our finger at people? You shouldn't do it like this. You shouldn't do it like this. Be very careful. There's one thing that a church should be known for, and that is that it's love-filled, full of the love of Jesus, full of love for one another too. And if that's not happening, then let's just ask ourselves a question. It's always, oh, the Ephesian church, naughty, naughty, they got it wrong, they lost their first love. I never lose my first love. Let me ask you a question. I ask myself as well. At what point, at what stage is your first love for God right now? Right now, today, 21st of May 2023, answer Jesus personally, yourself right now, the question that he says to them. You've forsaken your first love. Where is your first love for Jesus? Where is my first love for Jesus? What does your first love for Jesus look like today? What's it look like? And if God's convicting us here that we specialize in being unloving, if we specialize in doing all the opposite of whatever a love-filled church would be, then hear the words of Jesus to you and me today, but I have this against you. You've forsaken your first love. Let us, let Christ Church Bangkok, let you and I never be an individual or a church that has forsaken its first love for Jesus. And there's always the wonderful thing with God is a way back. There's always a way back. 
God always keeps the door of repentance open to us to get right. It's why we have the confession every week. And we shouldn't just do the confession as a rote sort of thing. It needs to be from our heart. But Jesus is bothered about the lack of love in the Ephesian church, even though the first few sentences you read about them, you think, hmm, they're a church that's doing pretty well. But they weren't doing very well in their love. What is what us as Christ Church Bangkok? Are we specialists in the love of Jesus and love for one another? Or are we more specialists in the gossip, the critical, the sniping, the whatever? But it's not it's before Jesus we all stand. And the Ephesian church would have been gutted to hear these words uh, in Revelation. Um, and, and so in, in the book of, in, in the Ephesian church, we see, you know, that timeline, AD 52, 62, they're still doing all right, 10 years on. Add on another possibly 40 years, they're not doing so well. I know where a church has been here for well over 100 years. It's right that as individuals and as a church, we keep examining ourselves before God, that we're individuals and we're a church that live to please Jesus. That is what a Christian is. We live to please Jesus. Not some of the time, not in some areas of our life, all the time in every area of our life. That is, um, that is um, really what the, the you know, the teaching here, I'm, I'm just trying to, 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 to pull out from, from the church in Ephesus. So we looked at the letter, but now we've seen the three snapshots. And there's a real challenge and encourage for me, for you, and for us as a church to make sure that we're living and behaving in ways that, that please God. And so four keys to a transformed church, four keys to a healthy church. And there's not one of those keys that isn't important. We can't, well, I can tick three out of four. Three out of four isn't adequate before God. Two out of four isn't adequate. One out of four isn't adequate. This four out of four. There's not one of those that can be missing or where we're falling short. And, and maybe if we were to do a, a, a review of our individual lives and also as our church life, how Jesus-centered am I, are you? And what about our church? How spirit-filled am I, are you? And what about our church? How confident am I at witnessing to the good news of the gospel, am I, are you? And what about us as a church? And how filled with the love of God am I, are you, and are we as a church? Four keys to a transformed church. Four wonderful insights. There's not many other churches in the New Testament where you get such great um, um, snapshots of how they're doing. And what letter would Jesus write to me and you? What letter would Jesus write to us as a church? And as Christians, as every one of us in, in church, all of us, we need to make sure that these four keys, pillars, uh, are in place for a healthy church. And as you just look at them up on the screen now, I wonder, is there one of them particularly that Jesus is maybe highlighting to you? More Jesus-centered, more Spirit-centered, spirit growing witnessing, growing our love. Discipleship is all about following the Master, that is Jesus. And here are four wonderful key ways that God wants each and every one of us to grow and develop in our discipleship. And also four keys that he wants us as a church, corporately together, to be. Let's just stand up for a moment. You've been sitting for a while. Just stand up. I'm going to just say a prayer. <clears throat> I'm going to say a prayer. And let's respond to God. The easy thing to do now is just to <clears throat> forget the sermon probably not even bother to file it away, just forget it. But actually, the Word of God is living and active, and God wants to speak to us through His Word. So let's just, in your own heart, just between you and God, how are you responding? What is God saying to you? Is there a prayer of confession or repentance that we need to say to God? God, forgive me. I've, I don't think I've ever told anyone else about Jesus ever before. Forgive me, God. Help me and give me opportunities, or whichever of these four areas it is. But let's just open our hands as if we're receiving from God. I'm just going to pray 
for God's presence just to come upon us and to encourage us. God isn't here to beat us with a stick. He's not going to give us our paper back. You've only scored one out of ten. Yes, if we have, then fine, but then we need to go on to grow and improve in those areas, not in our own strength, but in the power of God's Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit here is here to encourage us, to equip us, to strengthen us, to build us up, if we're willing to be built up. If we're not, ceiling, that's it, God won't. You can carry on being, you know, we can all be as hard towards God as we want to be. But that's not the spirit that God asks us to come to him. He asks us to come open, allowing him to fill us with his spirit. And then, like the Ephesian church, we too can begin to be transformed. So, Lord God, we just stand in your presence, Lord God. We're challenged by these snapshots into the Ephesian church, Lord God. And, Father, none of us are here saying, we've got all this covered and perfectly, perfectly ticked, Lord God. We're coming to you saying, Father, forgive us where we're falling short in any of these four areas, Lord God. Forgive us where we lack Jesus at the center of our lives. Forgive us when we, we've rejected the Holy Spirit. We've, we've believed a false theology that someone's told us that the Holy Spirit doesn't do anything now. What a, what a heresy, Lord God. Forgive us if we've believed anything like that. Lord, we want to welcome and encounter the presence of your Holy Spirit. Jesus, we want to grow in our witnessing. Forgive us when we're so poor and we're so pathetic often, Lord God. And Father, in our love, if we specialize more in hate or, or criticism or gossip, Father, forgive us, we confess that, and we ask you to grow each one of us individually and, each, and us as a church, Lord God, in all these four areas, that, that you might, there might be pillars here, Lord God, not people, but, but your presence of Jesus' Spirit witnessing and love, Lord God. May they be four pillars of this church. May be this, they be four pillars of our lives too, Lord God, that we might be a people that please Jesus, a people that please God, a people that are willing to allow God to shape and mold us. We come to you as individual lumps of clay, Lord God. And as a church, we're just a great big lump of clay. But we're praying and asking, Lord, for you to mold us, for you to shape us, for you to model us, for you to brush off the rough areas, Lord God, and for you to make us more like King Jesus in every area. So, Lord, come and do a work by your Spirit in each of our hearts, I pray. May the clay of our lives not be too hard for you to bear a work, but may the clay of our lives and of this church be moldable and shapeable, that we might please you in all that we are and all that we do. In Jesus' precious and mighty name.